Hello, everyone. So I have the privilege of talking today about some of the things that I love. Um, I really appreciate a lot of the speakers today talking about connecting passions. Um, and I've been in sports and tech for the better part of a decade, uh, longer, longer than 10 years, uh, since 2010 when I started uh, Stagnancy. Um, and so I'm going to connect some of the success in sports to some of the success that we have in business. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about how building the right scoreboard for you can lead to success. And I use scoreboards every day in my role as CTO at Diamond Phoenix. So let's see how I do that. I think this is it. Here we go. So, to start off on, in connecting uh, success and scoreboards, I'm going to share my favorite scoreboard moment. Uh, a couple of years ago, but uh, this was East Brunswick winning 16-14 uh, over Lakeland uh, for the New Jersey State title uh, in volleyball. Uh, second time I had won, it was a phenomenal moment, right? That moment right there where Chris blocked that ball for the win, come from behind victory, it felt great. And that was success, right? Um, and I want to take it back from just this one moment of success. There's so much that builds up to this moment of success. We can point to the scoreboard here in this one moment at 16-14 and say that was it. But there were all of the moments before that moment that brought us here. All of the hard work, all of the unseen scoreboards that we had, all of the goals, all the plans that we set out connect to this moment. And so while this was one of my favorite moments, uh, this is a little bit of a bittersweet moment for me. Uh, my first startup, Stat Easy, uh, as, as we mentioned, connected uh, statistics and video. But uh, while it started out uh, successful, right, I built a thing that was my passion. I solved a problem that I had. Uh, I raised over a million dollars in capital. I convinced some very smart people to work with me uh, and, and spent a lot of my life working on Stat Easy. Uh, once I transitioned into more than just volleyball outside my comfort zone, uh, my, my scoreboard changed a little bit. I wanted to go from just volleyball and build a thing that could connect with anyone in any sport. And that's really where, uh, when my scoreboard became just one scoreboard, uh, I, I really lost the way. The company faltered and ultimately failed. But as many speakers have pointed out, you learn from your failures. I learned a lot from that particular failure. Uh, it taught me how to run a company, right? Uh, I had the wrong metrics for Sad Easy. I had the wrong scoreboard. But speaking of the right scoreboards, how about this new scoreboard at PNC Park? Am I right, Travis? There we go. All right. Um, so, you know, but seriously, like the, the, the points that I learned from StatEasy is that it's really not just one scoreboard that tells you whether you're successful or not. Uh, it is everything that leads up to it, and especially in business. There are so many scoreboards uh, that we should all be keeping track of, right? Whether your technology is doing well, if you have the right product market fit, if you're marketing campaigns are going well. Those are all things uh, that we need to watch to be successful in business. But it's a little bit tricky because we also have to call our shot in business, right? So how can we call our shot and know that we're going to be successful? How can we put ourselves out there uh, and raise money, raise capital, and attract people to our, our company, especially as we're building a new thing that hasn't existed before? How can we have a called shot like Babe Ruth did here in 1932, when he did call his shot and hit home run. The same way that Babe Ruth did in 1932, with tens of thousands of hours of practice, all of those little scoreboards that he had, led him to that moment where he could call that shot. And in tech, we don't call it practice as much, we call it testing. And so uh, we test everything. In, in technology. We test all of those marketing campaign performances. We test that product market fit so that before anyone sets eyes on our product the very first time, we know that it should be a success. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it will be a success, right? So um, I will talk about some of how we test what we do at Diamond Connect and that we can be sure that what we have put out there in the market uh, is what will be successful. And this is what we do. So before I start talking about how we test, what do we do, uh, we manufacture these tiny little devices, 
show you, show you in another slide. Uh, but it is a sports motion technology that captures the swing. We can recreate the swing. We have all sorts of metrics about every single swing, and we take the very same uh, sensing platform and we put it into a ball, uh, and we're able to get lots and lots of metrics about every pitch that our users have. And there's a lot here, right? There are a lot of numbers, both on this screen and this screen. Those are all the scoreboards that we put out for our users so that our athletes know whether they're being successful or not. Everything's driven by these scoreboards. And so how do we test all of this? Right? Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about what makes diamond kinetics successful. Right? It is how easy it is to use and its accuracy. And so I will talk about how we make it accurate. So this, at its heart, is what diamond kinetics is. It is this tiny little sensor. Uh, it's smaller than a quarter, as you see here. Uh, and really, it's just a tiny computer. It's got a CPU, central processing unit. It's got RAM, random access memory, just like your normal computers do, like this laptop does right here. But unlike these computers, but very much like the phones that you have right now in your pocket, uh, it has IMUs, these little sensors that can sense the world around them. So we'll zoom in on just one sensor. Uh, it is all physics and math. I know we have a physics teacher in uh, the audience, and I have several physics students here. So this is all just a mass and a known spring constant. And if I know how much the mass is displaced, I know how much force was applied, and we use that information to recreate this link. So it's not magic, even though I swear it's magic that this tiny little thing can reproduce all of that. It's just physics and science. But we have to test it. How are we going to test it? This was a picture from our very first test, uh, and this orange robotic arm might look familiar to you if you've been to the Carnegie Science Center. The, a sibling to this robot, this is at Carnegie Mellon, but at the Carnegie Science Center there is a basketball shooting robot that shoots basketballs all day. I hope you've been there. If you haven't, please go. Um, because these robots are built for repeatability, we leverage that, and we program the robot to not shoot basketballs, but to take a baseball swing. And if our sensor was able to recreate the baseball swing that we programmed, then we were successful. And it did, it was a success. But there was more to go. It wasn't just this one scoreboard what, that pointed to success. We needed to go faster. It was too slow. You've seen the basketball robot shoot. It's pretty fast, but not fast enough. Travis knows how fast uh, these baseball players swing. It's amazing. So we had to build HitBot. So we HitBot. HitBot has got an encoder on the central set shaft, so we know how much uh, it rotates, and if we know where its position is over time, we know its velocity. Uh, so we measured twice, and we got the same result. We measured with the encoder, and we measured with our sensor, and ended up with the same result, which was great. So HitBot was a whole lot faster. HitBot ended up eating a whole bunch of wooden bats, uh, so we don't use wooden bats anymore with HitBot. It is metal bats only. So then we started testing pitch tracker. And as I mentioned, uh, we tested twice and got the same result here. Uh, so we were expecting the same thing with Pitch Tracker. Uh, and immediately, I'm sure this is jumping out to you in the audience, how can we get something like this when we're measuring the world around us and getting different results from the same sort of testing equipment? It's tough. Testing the real world, testing baseball IoT things is tough. The real world is messy. Uh, and did we potentially introduce some experimental error by uh, not orienting it correctly? What do we do here? Our scoreboard is telling us two different things. Is the right answer 68? Maybe. So in order to solve this problem, we had to go deeper. So we did. We went deeper into the pitching mechanics uh, and the physics of ball flight. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about not just the velocity, velocity is very important, but also the spin of the ball uh, and how the spin of the ball will affect the ball flight. We ended up testing uh, a lot of that, which was very, very hard to do. So the spin efficiency number here listed uh, on the bottom is 69%, talks a little bit about how the ball flies through the air. A football throw would be 0% spin efficiency, sort of spins like that, just how that spin orients with how the ball is traveling. And it really affects how the ball moves, which is very important for getting balls and strikes. So we took our pitch tracker and we compared it to what we had on the market. Um, there was some approachable technology on the market. 
Uh, and this is what we got. So for context, the orange line is what we were expecting. And the blue bars are what we got. And we were hoping that all of our blue bars were going to be inside of that orange line. And they are very clearly not. This was a failure for us. We paused the rollout of all of these advanced metrics because of this scoreboard. This was hard. We launched our product. We had Velo. We knew we had Velo, even though sometimes it's a little bit tricky. But we didn't get the spin, and we actually had to stop. We paused for over a year. It took us a long time. Um, but we ended up building out an entire computer vision process just to test and understand how that ball flew through the air. So we mark up balls. This is at uh, Pitt Softball. Uh, but you can see we've calculated that spin axis for that ball. And so although it took us a very long time to do, we ended up with the following results. Now you can see that the blue bars are definitely inside the orange. And this was a success. Now we didn't change anything. Um, we had that failing test before. We had that failing scoreboard. But we didn't change anything inside of our processing algorithm. What does that mean? Right? We, we must have found something uh, that was an issue with one of the testing, uh, one of the measuring devices out in the market. And we did. So we were then able to launch our pitch tracker ball with all of those metrics intact. It took us building our own scoreboard, our own metrics, to really understand that this could be a success. And that's one of the things that I want to leave you with. Right? Make sure you're building lots of scoreboards for your own success. Don't focus on just one big scoreboard at the end, right? It's the journey. I, I agree completely with that message. Um, and sometimes those little scoreboards are easy and fun to build. You get to use uh, baseball swinging robots or basketball shooting robots. Other times it takes years and years of hard work and building out entire branches of computer vision just to figure out how balls fly through the air. But it's worth it. Be sure to build your own scoreboards and listen to them. But what are your scoreboards telling you? Thank you.